Okay, good evening. We'll uh, call this meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission Subcommittee on Subdivision Regulations to order. It is Thursday, March 24th, 2022, and we are meeting via Zoom. So we will begin with a uh, roll call. And Mr. Hill? I saw Alvin come off mute and then go back on mute, but I believe he tried to say present. Okay, thank you. Ms. Salsi? Present. Mr. Lanky? Present. Mr. Williams? Ray's on mute. I think he's at yeah, in he's his, here. <laughs> yeah he's, he's definitely here and I think he might be at a sportsman's club meeting so he might be keeping himself on mute for the background noise. Gotcha. Uh, great. So we will move on uh, to item two, discussion yep. of proposed revisions to subdivision regulations. All righty. Bringing it up on the screen and I would like to point out that I do in fact now have a mouse. <laughs> thank, thank you, Brian Santos. Okay. Is that, uh, the one he, that the one he caught out in the woods? <laughs> yes, yes, it's a very smart mouse. All right, so Article 4, Section 4, Stormwater Management and Low Impact Development. I was able today to feather in um, what Marla sent because I had to carry over, carry it over from her attachment into this. Uh, and just to be clear, this is just the comments that she sent on this section that I was able to add in. Her other two emails were too extensive uh, for me to have time to do that today and also didn't relate directly to this content that we're reviewing. So when we go into the um, sort of the final round review with um, the discussion guide that I'll create, all of those comments will be included in there. Uh, especially the stuff that she was talking about related to ordinances that was super complex. So I wanna be sure I understand exactly what she's saying anyway, before we go on. So we will start here. Um, and again, just as a general comment before we start, because the stormwater management, low impact development, uh, and in the subsequent section, erosion and sediment control are really directly in Marla's wheelhouse. I'm highly inclined to take her comments sort of at face value, but we'll, we'll still go through and discuss and see if anybody's got any questions or thinks that something needs more clarification. Uh, okay, so let's see, extensive changes in this section. All right, uh, this is an earlier comment, not one from today. Uh, Marla recommending that this section be reviewed by a professional engineer. Uh, it has been reviewed by Janet. Janet is employed by, well, Janet's firm, is employed by the town to handle stuff on the MS4 permit, which this directly relates to. So that request has essentially already been met. But doesn't... Doesn't Janet, I mean, she said no vested interest in the outcome. Uh, Janet's under the town. So I would like to see somebody that has no connection with the town review this. Well, I mean, she is in the employ of the town to review this very topic. So I, I think that what Marla is referring to is somebody who wouldn't, per, per, uh, like we get, we get stuff sent to us by all kinds of engineers, right? And they may have an agenda in recommending or not recommending a certain measure. Uh, well, because... somebody that's not vested that has no connection with the town. That's what I take as not vested interest in the outcome. So somebody that has nothing to do with the town would be better for my thinking. Uh, the option we would have might be to send it to NECOG. They are super slow. Like we could be sitting on this for years. <laughs> no, don't. I, it's just a thought. It's just my yeah. thought. No vested interest. And NECOG also has a vested interest. So I prefer to take what Marla says with no vested interest. That means nobody that has anything to do with the town or the state possibly. Uh, okay, I'll, I will add it here as a possible option. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so let's see. Marla's first change here, just to go through, is she moved this uh, new number four into this, I'm sorry, new number five into this position. Um, this is under section intent. So I'll just read them through briefly. Intent, this section is intended to minimize pollution from non-point source runoff to mitigate impacts to the hydrologic system from development. Three, reduce or prevent flooding, stream channel erosion, and or other negative impacts created by stormwater runoff. Four, promote the application of low impact development LID strategies. And then this new number five, to meet the requirements of Thompson's registration for coverage under CT Deep's general permit for the discharge of stormwater from small municipal separate storm sewer systems. And that is the MS4. Issued pursuant to section 22A through 430B of the Connecticut general statutes. And what she's saying is she actually cut and pasted this from a, a later section. Uh, that was a good edit on her part. So moving on to stormwater management requirements, she has suggested edits to number one. And again, I'll read it through if anybody has questions or comments or thinks something isn't clear enough. We'll discuss as we go. Subdivision applications shall include stormwater management provisions by using the best available technology to treat stormwater quality and control stormwater quantity prior to its discharge to any wetland, watercourse, or existing stormwater drainage system. All design, prin all design principles, this should be a singular. All design principles, methods, and practices shall be in compliance with the standards found in the 2004 Connecticut Stormwater Quality Manual, CSQM, by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, CTDEEP, as amended, and the latest edition of the CT. Drainage Manual, unless the Commission finds, based on the report by said professional engineer, there are limiting factors that warrant a variance from such standards. Does everybody find that sufficiently clear? A couple of language points here. But... What, what would be a variance um, from that standard? Well, I don't know, and I don't think there is a specific variance um, that anybody would have in mind. My, my assumption here is that uh, Marla, in her professional experience, has seen occasions when a variance has been sought and also warranted. Um, and it might may be one of those things like we you can't foresee all circumstances, right? There's always going to be something that physically is novel, right, on a given site that may preclude one of these standards being followed. So I think that's just safety valve language, if I were to hazard a guess. Uh, I did see Dan Malo is in on the call. He's our conservation agent and is also a wetlands agent for um, Windsor Locks. Dan, do you have any insights there? Uh, just as you said that uh, there's not a particular mechanism that it's just safety valve language. The only other thing I'm noticing is that she has here based on the report by said professional engineer, but I don't believe a professional engineer is referenced in the rest of this text. So this I think needs a little adjustment. I think this is probably...
you are adding that verbiage, aren't you? Yeah, like I say, uh, unless somebody puts up a, a, a real red flag, I'm very much inclined to take Marla's language in her area of expertise as closely as possible. I just noticed from a linguistic point, based on a report by said professional engineer, no professional engineer is referenced above. So this needs just to be modified a little bit. Uh, on the report by a professional engineer licensed in the state. state of okay. I think that's more, oops. I think that's more where what we need there. Okay. Anybody got anything else on that? No. All right, number two. Provisions for stormwater management, including all practices and stormwater systems shall be designed by a professional engineer licensed to practice in the state of Connecticut and shall be identified in a report with accompanying site plans, both signed and sealed by said engineer. This report shall contain a description of site strategies used, what parts of the CSQM and CT dot drainage manual were followed and include the design calculations produced to support the function of the stormwater management design features proposed. At a minimum, the report shall identify practices and designs involving, and then the list. Let's take a look at Marla's note. Uh, report requirement added, so that's that last sentence or two in blue. Report requirement added to specify the engineer's report to include all stormwater management concepts from pollution reduction, groundwater recharge, runoff control system design operations and maintenance. And she has MD4, I think that was a typo. I think she meant MS4 requirements for direct connected impervious areas. That's what DCIA stands for. Uh, any questions there? I think we're gonna get through this quickly, by the way, guys, because this is an area where we have uh, comments based on expertise, but we want to be sure we have everything covered anyway. Uh, all right, everybody seems okay. These pink comments are earlier ones. Let's just take a quick look because a lot of the earlier comments were language or outlining. Yeah. Oh, I think the pink one is about outlining. Yeah, uh, she did add um, peak flow control of the two-year frequency, uh, the two-year recurring storm events. Essentially, is that that's what that number two refers to. I feel like we had taken that out when we originally did this. She added it back in, and she cites. Um, the CSQM and a specific section. That being the case, I'm inclined to let it stand. I don't think mm -hmm. we took it out for any particularly strong reason other than perhaps convention. And that may have been based on feedback from a couple of engineers, but uh, if it's consistent with a controlling document, I think it should probably stay in there. What do you guys think? Yeah, no, I agree. What was that again, Kira? So if you look at this letter C um, for the items that the, the required report should include, it says peak flow control uh, as per CSQM section 7.6 of the two, 10, 25 and 100 year frequency storm events. Previously that started with the 10 year uh, in, the, in the draft before Marla's comments, I should say and as currently actually also in our zoning regulations based on the review from 2020. Marla's suggesting we add back in the two year frequency storm events. Um, and that is to make it consistent with the controlling document that she is citing, uh, the CSQM, which is what Connecticut Storm Water Quality Management uh, document. Correct. Yeah. But there has been just, um, I was on uh, 
I was watching the news the other day, just and and, and it, it really caught it, it caught my interest and it piqued it too. Is uh, one of the um, so-called engineers, and I'm talking global. He was saying that what used to what was the hundred-year storm is now being considered a 50 year. So all of this stuff is gonna be changing. So this is something that we might have to think about going forward because they're really doing some study on it. And I paid attention to it because it was, it, like I said, it caught my interest when I heard the hundred year storms or whatever are now they're calculating it. It's now gonna be 50 years. So that's a big drop, you know, that's a good 50% drop. So it's something that we might need to put in the back of our mind going forward. Yeah, it, it definitely is volatile information. I mean, we were looking at the revised or the proposed revised FEMA flood maps. Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah. Right they're, now, they're, and and they are different. I mean, they- Compared to, and it, and it all goes back to, uh, they should have left the, the whole city underwater uh, instead of trying to salvage it. But it, it's it's it all has to do with what's been going on in the Gulf, yeah, you know, with New Orleans and all of those coastal cities and everything down there, and and it's reaching, as it was the person was saying, this is that everything is now encroaching more inland than they ever expected it. That's, you know, that, that's beginning to be a little scary. Yeah, well, we're already, I mean, this is a little tangential. We are already seeing uh, impacts, like I say, in the revised flood maps, the, uh, yep. the flood levels are higher. I mean, never mind the Gulf Coast here in Connecticut. Uh, yep. You know, a couple few feet here and there in certain areas, but, um, you know, it, it, it's definitely not something that stays stable over, over time. All right, uh, what do we got? Cool. Yeah, let's see. And here in letter F, and again, these are items under that report. Uh, let's just look at it quickly. The retention of the water quality volume for the site as defined in the CSQM for new development and redevelopment of sites that are currently developed with a directly connected impervious area, that's DCIA, of less than 40%. She just recommends spelling out uh, what the acronym stands for in the first instance. That is a typical convention. And she also, you'll notice here, she's uh, recommended deleting these items here. Uh, but strictly speaking, that's actually because she has moved them to other places in the section. So this information is still required. It's just either already referred to or will be referred to later. Sure. Any questions on any of that? Moving forward to letter C, stormwater system design and calculations. Your mouse, I have, oops. Now my mouse runs all over the place. Okay, uh, let's take a look here. She had, some deletions that I believe she found redundant. So we're starting with computations and design criteria shall be in accordance with the latest edition of the CTDOT drainage manual. Stormwater systems shall be designed using LID principles as identified in the CSQM to the greatest extent possible. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, this number two, which refers to the applications for subdivisions with four or more lots is just moved to a different spot. So I know that to be the case. That's a minor edit. These are also minor edits, just adding citation documents. All right, so let's look at number four, submission of stormwater drainage information. Again, she had some outlining commentary, but she's actually provided those edits and I carried them over. So we should be good with the outlining stuff right now. 
Uh, the engineer's report shall include the following specific information. And she again has made a couple of suggestions, uh, mostly condensing. No new concepts added. Okay, let's look at this new number 11 or newly numbered 11 drainage to offsite properties. We've got some changes in the text here. A, no increase in stormwater peak flows or volume of runoff from two, 10, 25 and 100 year storms shall be allowed unless it can be demonstrated there will be no downstream damage or deleterious effects. The following items shall be investigated in determining whether increased peak flows or runoff volumes are compatible with the overall downstream drainage system. And then these are unchanged, but we may as well look at them. The timing of peak flows from sub watersheds, the increased duration of high flow rates, the adequacy of downstream drainage features, and the distance downstream that the peak discharges are increased. Seems fairly straightforward. Does anybody have any questions there? This could be a nice quick one tonight. I wanna look at this older comment here. So I'm not sure what this is exactly related to. Let's see. Stormwater detention structures. And this is an, a first round comment from Marla. Recommend that when a detention structure is to be owned by the town, that it be limited to surficial structures and subsurface structures prohibited. Underground detention structures can be expected to have increased maintenance costs to the town caused by specialized equipment needed for cleaning or repair. Some underground detention structures are considered to be confined spaces under OSHA, requiring special breathing apparatus and special training for working in a confined space. Uh, my follow-up note was that I would run it by J&D. I do not have any comment back from them. Um, John B, as a longtime construction guy, it, is this uh, is this pinging any bells for you? Uh, I mean, I, I find lo Marla's logic compelling. Um, anybody have any thoughts there? You're, you're you're on what the detention structures? Yeah, yeah. So, and she's making a comment just on this very first sentence stormwater detention structures, surface or subsurface, shall be designed as an integral part of the stormwater treatment system, as well as limiting peak discharge from the storm drainage system of the developed area where such discharge would adversely affect receiving streams and or storm systems. So Marla's suggestion there is essentially that we don't even permit subsurface detention structures uh, for the reasons in, in her comment that they um, that they have increased maintenance costs, that in some cases OSHA considers them confined spaces. Uh, I, I guess my question for you from a from a construction point of view is, is it feasible to indicate that subsurface detention structures are not permitted. Are there occasions in your experience in construction where you have seen them as the only possible option or something along those lines? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, it, 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 it comes down to what, if something, if, if let's say a subdivision is being built, um, up on an incline, you know, like, like, like a hill, you know, you go up you yep. go, and you're going up, you build the road, you go up the hill, your greatest increase of uh, stormwater 
runoff is, is you know, the size of the pipe coming down because you're going to need to keep it as control. But a lot of times they find instead of putting in pipe, drainage pipe, which would could be 24 inch to 36, 36 inches in the ground is, is so it would contain it in that. But it, over time, it could build up enough sediment where it could get blocked or, you know, uh, cr like create its own dam. With the, with it as an open uh, surface, what they do, what I have done and worked on sites is, is they, they dig trenches, they'll dig a trench and they fill it with riprap, you know, different sizes, depending on what they feel would be to help keep slow the water, uh, the flow of water. Mm -hmm. The key is to control the flow of water. So when they put in detention, we call them detention ponds. So right. when they build this canal, they build this thing out of stone, they'll build one. What it does, it, it'll, it'll catch, it'll hold back so much water. Then you have what they call like a dam on, on one end. So when it gets up to a certain point, it overflows and hits the next level. Sometimes you, they might put in three detention ponds by the time it hits the bottom or whatever so you're slowing the process down because you know what happens when water starts running and you got nothing to slow it down it right. just takes that's what detention ponds were designed for or detention structures uh like i said i built many of them in in different areas in massachusetts on on sites where they were using the land with you know, uh, put the road in and they went up a little hill, you know, what they call a hill to put houses up and everything. And the biggest problem is the people, uh, well, I'll use an example, Green Acres, if they, if they decided, if they built a detention, some type of a detention on Green Acres, there would have been less problems in the beginning because you still got the wetlands area down below on the right-hand side and across the street where it right. leads so in. The detention yeah. pond piece I, I get completely, but, but that, ac according to this, is a surface detention structure. It, it, what correct. Marla's referring to is a subsurface, meaning something that is enclosed beneath the That's surface. The that would be your pipes. But now that you have, they have to know what the flow of water would be if you want to put subsurface in. That would be meaning pipe. And then you would have to have certain bulkheads in certain areas you know, where the water would come in, hit, it'll create, it's like a baffle system, comes in and hits it on, the, it comes this way, it diverts it to the right, then it diverts it to the left. You have different gates, okay? But the problem with that is that sometimes if you get a lot of debris, it, it can block it because it, it can't flow through where an a open surface above, they find that you can go in with a little, grappled type of machine, you know, that to grab stuff and pull it out and keep on going. You, you've got a better control of it. You can pull the, 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 the debris or material out. Where a subsurface, they, they can be very, um, uh, they can be structured, you know, they can back up over time. Because you need to so go- So are, are you agreeing, John, that subsurface detention areas should not be permitted? subsurface should, yes. be, should not be permitted yes that's uh, what marla's contention is well i'm gonna have to, uh, and, and 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 i respect marla but and i i worked on too many of them and i found we found what like i said in massachusetts when i did it you know connecticut they have those they have them in areas it all depends of the area itself they if, if it's if it's a real tight area they and they don't want to take up a lot of area because when you do a subsur up the subsurface everything's underground you can you can you don't see it's out of sight out of mind but you do above ground and all that stuff you get to see it but you can it's controlled better i i i it's half a dozen one or the other it all depends on what the town wants to do or the or the subcontractor, sub I mean, the, the, the developer's got to do to gain whatever he needs. You know, it, it, I can go either way, but I like, I like, I, I don't like the sub, 
the sub one because it, it's too much maintenance. It can be more maintenance than a above ground, in my opinion. But that's yep. my okay. Opinion. Well, that yeah, that's what I was trying to get at there. Uh, uh, it's the main. Yeah, you have to go underground. To, if if you put one that's underground, then you're going into like you said earlier. You know, you need uh, uh, scuba gear to clean them out. Like John says, at least with the, the sub ones, you know, I mean, uh, above ones, you can uh, just reach right in there with a backhoe with a thumb on it, clean them out. Correct. Yeah, I, I guess the, the question is just fundamentally simpler, which is, do we believe that it is feasible to say that stormwater distension structures, that we're just not even going to allow the subsurface ones because of the higher maintenance burden uh, now I think from I think from what John was just saying that although he agrees that they're higher maintenance that they may still sometimes be necessary, uh, it, and if it, that's the if that's the case then we have to leave it as is. That that's my question. I mean I agree with what John said, but my question is is there a, a situation where there's no other alternative to put them under? Well, that's what I mean. It it it, it depends on the location or what the location is, okay? And, and, and the whole idea is, is that uh, the ones that I put in, they found that by keeping them above ground, you can control the flow of water better. So you might put in, you. I remember on one job, I think it was out in Northbridge, we put in five different detention ponds going you know, down just so, it, it would because if it got it to the bottom where it was going to go i'll tell you what it was going to take out it could take out the other side of, of the property you know where all the houses were because it would just be like a a, a a you know like one of the rivers in town here getting overflow with what being obstructed here you could go in clean it out quicker you could reach like like uh like um uh, Mr. Williams just said, you can reach in there with a, with, with like a, um, well, an excavator or, or, or what they got, a, you know, anything with a thumb on it. You just go in and grab the stuff, pull it out. But if you got an underground one, at some point, there can be some, there can be blockage, especially if they put those um, box culverts in and they have to have those baffle systems. Now, the, it depends on how the baffle systems are separated. You know, are they going to be six feet apart? seven feet uh is this thing going to be 20 feet long because you need length to create the, to help slow the water down but it does it does become a i call it a garbage collector you know it just it, it, if one branch gets stuck this way and another one next thing you know it just piles up and if you got leaves running through it boom you got what they call a beaver dam there you go hmm. just like that now, now you got to take the top off. And you, gotta, you know, it's it's a little more labor intense than something that's above surface. But it, but it, the 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 area could determine what is feasible and not feasible would yeah. be the okay. best. That, yeah. that that's the best way I can put it. It, it. it you know, let's roll the dice on now. That that's the best way I can say. I hope we come up with seven. <laughs> Levels, you know but uh it's so, it, it, it's not an easy thing that's why an engineer you need a, a real uh, a, a certified engineer that has done the, like the like femur and all of them that's what they do they look at the field army corps of engineers the same thing they look at what is the feasible process you know to control storm water so when 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 at all possible it should be surface. Yes. And that subsurface would be an extraordinary situation. All possible it should remain on the surface because of the maintenance problem. Correct. See, okay. The, yep. The maintenance the you, and you you you're correct Ms. Salsi, it's correct because maintenance if it, if the town is going to be responsible for it, let's just put it that way. The, the thing is, is that it, it'll be, it's cheaper when you have your town crew go out and do it, clean up and everything, they'd be able to move right along quicker, you know, pick it up, throw in a truck, do this, do that, you know, but if you got an underground one, now you gotta, you know, you gotta pull these covers up, you gotta get in there, you just can't go in and grab this stuff right away, some stuff you gotta get in, you know, you, you, know, you know, they might put one or two people in there. 
like I said, I prefer above ground, but if we have to go, if has to go underground. Yeah, I think I think Jane's got a good suggestion, which is just to tweak the language to indicate right. that wherever possible, stormwater detention structures should be surface structures, but right. where subs, yeah, I can yeah. work with that. that yeah, that's something but, I can work with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, you don't have to put a put one in that's twenty feet wide by fifty feet above ground. You can put a multiple of them to be equal to one big one. You know, that's why they put these small ones in. Matter of fact, I just put one in a year ago. They were uh, up here in Plainfield at a at a solar farm. You know, when, where the road went in, they were putting it in. They would mm -hmm. they would. They were putting all the, the rip wrap in with the stone and everything, and they would put a nice little ten foot by ten foot little you know uh, uh, detention pond. They went another 50, 60, 70 feet, put another one in. They put in like six or seven on this incline that was uh you know it was like a I uh, what was it about at least a thirty degree from the top to the bottom. All I was doing is just to slow the water down, so when it hit the bottom and hit the brook and everything, so you know it wouldn't wash out. You know make the brick one part of the brook bigger, you know what I mean? It'd take it right out, but that's all that it's, in, it, it's intended for is to slow the process of the water. Yep. yep, yep. The flow of water, I'm sorry. All right, I'm trying to look at some of these comments and they relate to text that I think was taken out in the, pri in, um, the prior iteration. So I don't have it for comparison. Uh, all right, let's look at this design procedure. Uh, who's got the, the book with the existing subdivision regulations with I them? I do, Kira. Okay, so let's look at where design procedure is in there. What page you on there, um, Mr. Chair? Um, well, that's the, I'm, um, this is the design this procedure. I got it, it's a 39. 39 in the existing book. Yeah. Yep. So I'd like to figure out what these comments are specifically related to. This one here. Oh, in fact, this is on maintenance roads. Why was this paragraph deleted? All detention basins that are to be under the control of the town should always be designed to provide the town with access to maintain, repair, or modify, as this could be needed in the future. Some form of this language needs to be kept. What is missing in that? Because I see this maintenance roads and it says here, maintenance roads and easements shall be provided for all detention structures. The road shall be at a minimum of 12 feet wide, capable of providing access for maintenance and emergency vehicles. Grade shall not exceed 10%. W what exactly is missing there, Joe, that Marla is suggesting I, should be added back in? Um, it seems to me like that she perhaps added it back in because that is the language of the existing. Interesting. Yeah, that's so, what you just so that must well. okay. So that just must have been the first pass, and there it is. Okay, so that we can clear that comment. Uh, okay, here on that uh, maintenance road, twelve yeah. feet. Yeah, uh, it should be fifteen or sixteen, not not twelve feet. Actually, Alvin's correct. Twelve feet is not very wide. You can't even get two cars on a 12 foot, uh, 12 feet side by side. And I'm talking the I'm talking the little Toyotas and uh, Subarus and all of them. And just out of curiosity, I wonder if this was just a flat carryover. Joe, is that a carryover from what ex the existing language? Yes. Okay, so that would be a change based on reality, I guess. Uh, is everybody else more, more comfortable as well with increasing that to 15 feet or 16 feet? I'd go with 16. Got a question, if it's a maintenance road or an easement, there shouldn't be cars passing each other, no? Well, that's, that is definitely true. Uh, but 
Ray. But you're, you're right, but think of the vehicle that has to go down there. Maintenance roller to have overhanging limbs besides. Mm -hmm. Remember the vehicles that they got running up and down the roads today, especially maintenance vehicles, you know, some of them have to be 10 feet wide or better. So, you know, and plus if, if it's a certain type of vehicle that has outriggers on it, they need at least 16 feet minimum to put the outriggers on to do any type of work or maintenance, depending on what they're doing. Sometimes you can get away with a smaller unit, you know, when you're hauling a, a, a unit down like a mini excavator on these trailers and stuff, you know, the trailers are some of these trailers are 10 feet wide, uh, that utility trailers that they haul the equipment on. Uh, uh, a maintenance crew that's going down with something, they're going to be carrying at least three or four different types of uh, equipment, you know, instead of running back and forth to get one at a time, they want to try to put on two or three on a, a, a trailer. So the trailer, some, some of the trailers are 10 feet wide, eight to 10, eight foot, eight to 10 feet. We have to think of the equipment that's being used today is not what yeah, it was. I, I wasn't thinking an excavator on a trailer hanging off like that, John, you're right. You know, I, I'm just, I'm just throwing, throwing it, you know. <laughs> no, no, you're, no, you're hundred percent right on that. You know, uh, you know, it's better to be wider than it is to, you know, have something small and then try to get something out of it. Oh, how, how, well, you're this to that, your regs say this, you know, let's, let's just make it easier in the long run. You know, if I was a contractor and I was going to go down and do this work, you know, and I got this piece of equipment, I'm not, I can't take it down there because the, the road ain't really wide enough, so to speak, you know, and and that's from my point of view, but. Uh, you yeah, know, I, 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 I agree with that, John, because the, the maintenance vehicles we have now are much larger than what they used to be. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, if, sounds like we've got good consensus there that we should up that to 15 or 16 feet. Uh, uh, Tara, the, there's one thing I would probably add to that sentence is, yep. is that it, it all depends. 16 feet would be what we call, would be correct, is because of the maintenance vehicles that would have to travel this road. So you want to give them the, the space, you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, you, you don't have to put that in, but I, I think that, you know, this way, if they say, well, maintenance vehicles, and that's what it's designed for is the maintenance vehicles to accommodate a, va a maintenance vehicle. I think that's the best way I could say it. I mean, everybody has to agree with it. I'm just giving that a point of view. You know, if, if they think that, that those words should be put in or verbiage, I mean, that's... Would, no, because would because we need to we need to think about that because you know we don't need to put up per se roadblocks for them to even get in to do the maintenance. It has to be wide enough so that they're not struggling. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. I think that's a, I think that's a fair point, John. Um, I've got it here in the note too. So that uh, yeah, especially if there's corners on the road too. If you got a you know a thirty foot trailer with an excavator on it, you're right, one hundred percent. You know, a 12 foot trying to make a turn with that, you know, whatever, you know, it, Ray, it's going to be, it, it's the, the trailer wheels and everything are going to be over that 12 foot, you know, on a turn or whatever, depending on how, how the turn is, you know, if it's a long turn, you got a shot at, but if it's a sharp turn, uh oh, you're in trouble. And then it's more work, which <laughs> exactly. they don't need and they don't yeah. need it. Right. right. Good, good, good planning makes less work later. Yes. Correct. All right, Thanks. let's look at this other comment from Marla about fire protection. Detention basins are not normally designed with deep water for stormwater quality renovation. Water depth is generally no greater than one foot, not enough to be a fire protection pond. If a fire pond is desired, recommend keeping the stormwater management function separate from the fire pond i.e. two separate impoundments. Uh, uh, uh. And again, my follow-up there is, and Joe, uh, confirm for me if I'm correct, if this is in the current subdivision regulations, it may only be something that was carried over in the zoning regs from older language too. That would be harder uh, to verify right now. Yeah, is it in the subdivision regs? It's not in the subdivision. It's at least not 
in this, it's not in the detention structures section of the subdivision regulations. I think that was a carryover from what was included in the zoning regulations, but I think that that piece itself was a carryover from the whatever those whatever year those last ones were done, the 2008 or 2012. Um, I'll have to look at that actually in hard copy in the office. Uh, subdivision regs. I mean, I just wonder if that's obsolete. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to picture and maybe somebody else can offer me an example. I'm trying to picture a, a modern subdivision plan coming in because that's what this is dealing with, obviously, suggesting that there's a fire pond on the property. That's, that seems very 19th century. Uh, back in the day, okay, <laughs> they used to have these fire ponds. Actually, if you were to drive down uh, a lot of your towns in Connecticut, Mass and Rhode Island, there are certain areas where there was a pond that was, a well, it originally was a brook that used to be in a kind of like, dammed it up to create a, 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 a pond and you would see those pipes that were sticking out you know with like a you know with the thing and where they could hook the thing up and pump out of that pond to you know to feed a fire or, get, or, or run a truck down if the fire was here they do have those still around are they used like they you they used to no because your trucks today that the fire trucks they got today they can carry up to two thousand gallons of water and, you know, and, and if you've got fire hydrants all over the place now, everything is fire hydrants where it's all in the ground. The fire ponds actually have become obsolete. One, because of when you start pumping out of those fire ponds, if they haven't been maintained or dredged over the years, the where the pipe is at the bottom is, is sucking mud in or, you yeah. know, go uh, there. So they found that that was hurting the trucks because once it got in the truck and then the truck had to pump this water out down at the bottom of the tank after it settled, they had to go in and clean it. And sometimes it screwed up the pump in the truck. So now you're talking a big maintenance cost to replace that tank or the pump. So that's why the fire ponds in all reality are pretty much non-existent. Okay. Yeah, this this seems to me, like I said, very 19th century or, you know, yes. early 20th century at uh, best. Uh, I, I'm feeling like this is obsolete. Uh, um, go ahead, Alvin. In Woodstock, there were several. Several. But they're not new. They're old, right? They, they wouldn't have been installed in anything new. No, I haven't seen a, a fire pond built. <sighs> I, I remember as a kid, you know, I, I mean, Woodstock on one night, on 193, uh, 190, um, yeah, 197, going into Woodstock right there on the right-hand side. Uh, uh, just before, uh, what's, what's the name? There's a fire point. They pulled the pipe out. Uh, I'm going to say, I think they pulled the pipe. I, if I don't see, I haven't seen it in 10 years, but that, that's what they found was over time that when they needed water, they were going to it. Back in the day, it was good. But over the years, and I'm talking, we're talking 20, 30, 40 years, Alvin, you know, he, he's been around as long as I have. I mean, over time, you know, the pipe where it was, where it was, would pump clear water. Now it's probably got enough mud and everything from all the water, runoff water that came, that ran in, you know, ran into it to create that fire point. So you've got a hazard. Actually, you've got a hazard in all reality. And, Again, my opinion. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example, quick example. I remember uh, 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 Green Acres, okay? Uh, a Walker's Pond, which is right across from where Jane lives on the lower end. The, the, the pond in the back behind um, Healy's and everything. 
Ton, uh, Quinnabog and that used to run right over there because they had the access to go in and pump water out of there, you know, to, you know, to pump water into the trucks so they would have, didn't have to go. Or they went down to the Quinnabog River right off of 197. They don't do that anymore because now I wouldn't, they can, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want them pumping water out. Their trucks would get so jammed up because of what has the debris that is now collected in there. So I totally understand what you're saying. That, that's what I mean. Yeah, I, the, I'm pretty sure all of our local trucks are pumping directly out of the French River, right? Right now. Well, uh, not necessarily. It all, depend, it all depends where the fire is, because I've seen them pump right out of Genesis Pond on Port of Plain Road, and I've seen them pump out of the pond on Mary Road, and uh, you know, there's no pipes at either one of them. And those are just no naturally. Problem. Those are just naturally occurring waterways right, right. But, yeah. but we they do don't have one fire hydrant on o'leary's pond on the bottom of uh 193 where o'leary's construction is they do have a fire pond there with a pump with a pipe yeah but, but is it you know, but the, fire department, it? the fire departments can pump right out of a pond that you know they don't need um with the trucks they have they do not need you know to have a pipe to pump out of right well, yeah, because of the, because of the because of the assist, uh, the hoses and everything they got are now special design that they don't have to go down uh, down ten feet. They can they can pump five feet from the surface and they're getting good clean. You know, you you within five feet of the surface water, you you still got good you clean water. But it, but the old days when they put those pipes in and everything, they they sunk them down almost like say 10 feet or 15 feet, you know, and, but back in those days, it was, it was still good, clean water, but over the years with all the debris and everything, you know, <laughs> you, you, you got, you got, you can have some of those places that they probably got four or five feet, six feet of muck now on the bottom or better, you know, and where's the pipe down at the bottom of the muck. So when you stop pumping, you're, puck, you're pumping muck first before you get, before the water finally gets sucked into it. By then, it's too late. I think it might be just another case of what, what's the simple question here. And the simple question seems to me to be, and maybe I'm wrong, um, is that, you know, here's this item that has been in zoning regulations for who knows how long, based on the idea that that is a convention. If there is no reasonable expectation that there will be a fire pond included in a subdivision plan, is this necessary? We can all agree that they exist. We know that they exist. There are examples people can cite, but I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm only stuck on it because it just seems so obsolete and unnecessary. And I would love it if somebody could say to me with certainty, oh no, you would absolutely want to have a fire pond in these circumstances, in which case I would say, oh, yes, let's absolutely keep it in. But to me, this just seems like keeping an antique in the book. Okay. But I could be wrong. you got a very valid point there, Tara. But now I'm going to throw this at you. If, you know, who in their right mind, I'm looking at it as a developer, okay? Why would I want to do, uh, um, put in a fire pond okay who's going to maintain it who's going to take care of it i the agree homeowner? Oh, no the whole i'm just saying once i develop the property you i'm told i have to put a fire pond in i'll put it in but once i sell all the houses and everything's gone i'm not going to stick around and maintain it because now you have to have a maintenance cost you need to take and stay on top of keeping it clean okay because that's the problem is if it's not used over and you know used and pumped in or do this or do that, you're gonna gonna have sediment build up over time, and that's the key. That's why they dredge. That you know a lot of places you know some towns uh, they dredge they dredge certain areas because they have to keep the water clean where the pipe is, and that means a cost. You have to hire a contractor to come in with a crane with a with a dredging with a dredging. Um, um a dredging crane and everything to keep it dredged yeah that's cost that's cost that means cost what today's fire apparatuses we've got today they don't need uh, how okay uh right how often do you see any fire trucks in east thompson ever going to a, to one of those ponds and pumping water 
only if there's a fire close uh, proximity to, you know, to the area, you know. But um, how is the key? How often? Once every couple of years, maybe. But in the meantime, you have to you have to keep it maintained too, because you don't want the sediment buildup. See, that's the key is the is the buildup of sediment at the bottom. Oh well, you're talking about the one with the pipe. Yes. Oh, I I haven't, I haven't seen I've probably seen one there twice in my lifetime. Yeah. I, I thought you were talking about the other ponds. Well, it, well, the other ponds, it, 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 they're, they're pumping from within the the top five six feet. Okay, yeah, not, if that prob probably two or three feet. Yeah, but because the hoses they got they got the flotations on them now, so the thing won't sink to the bottom. And that's the key is is they got the they got all these things to hold the hose, the you know, the suction end of the hose at least say a minimum of five feet. So they're pumping clear water all the time. That's what right. they a lot of play, a lot of them now they have those flotation things, so it holds the holds the hose up because the hose itself will sink right to the bottom, but not, you know what I mean? It'll go right to the bottom. So the key is to keep it above. So that's a good thing. And it's, and it's faster to run down to a pond is, you know, to drive all over looking for one of those pipes in the ground where, you know, at, 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 you know, uh, with, for the fire thing, you're right. You know, I, I, how often do we see fire trucks, you know, running out? Know, like I remember, like I said, Walker's Pond right there. I mean, but do they use it now? No. <laughs> like, Kira? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm finally back. My computer uh, internet keeps going in and out. Anyway, oh, okay. Back on those. Uh, my, did you hear my comment about no. fire ponds? I heard that you said there were several in Woodstock, and I think that's the last thing I heard you say. That's correct. That's when I lost the internet. Yeah. Okay, was there, uh, was there anything follow up on that? No, other than I, you know, everyone's talking about it's cute 19th century stuff. No, it's very important firing brush fires, forest fires. Okay, so there's an instance in which one might be a practical installation. Precisely. All right, so let's yep. add that note here. I believe they do have their purpose, but like, you know, without the pipes that pull up all the sludge, because uh, Alvin's correct, a brush fire, uh, anything that catches, they are very good to have around. Okay. That's, well, you, you, your stormwater drain offs, you can create that too. You can add that right into that to keep the pond at a certain level too. When you get a lot of rain, it'll, it'll hold it back. You know, if the pond is built right, you know, Okay, so if so, if there is a practical application, and it does seem that there may be, uh, then I I guess I would generally suggest retaining it. But I see John's point as well that if we're going to retain the item, uh, it should include language about you know future maintenance. So I'll, I'll I'll monkey with that a little bit and see what we can come up with. Because that's where the problem's going to be is you you got to maintain them. You just can't ignore yep. them. You know? Uh, okay, so this looks kind of weird on the screen, uh, but this actually is one title, Special Flood Hazard Areas and Floodways Requirements. The, the way the switch over from the PDF when I converted it did some weird formatting things. Uh, okay, so again, the title of this numbered item is Special Flood Hazard Areas and Floodways Requirements. And let's this comment. That's just correcting the name and number of the ordinance. So that is just a citation. We don't need further comment on that. Uh, let's see. Let's just read through this quickly. When the subdivision includes land in a special flood hazard area or regulated floodway, the lots, streets, drainage, and other improvements shall be demonstrated to, to be or shall be designed to be safe from flood damage and shall conform 
to the ordinance number 10-055, ordinance amending the flood damage prevention ordinance adopted September 29, 1988, as may be amended, and to the following. The lots and such improvements shall be consistent with the need to minimize flood damage within the special flood hazard area and shall be capable of use without danger from flooding or flood related damages. All utilities and facilities such as sanitary sewer systems, water supply systems, and electric and gas systems shall be located and constructed to minimize or eliminate flood damage. And what is struck here is the storm drainage required under Article 3, Section 4 shall be designed to reduce exposure flood hazards. And Marla deleted that because the requirement is implicit in, implicit in the standards. Okay, uh, fair enough and streets shall be of such elevation or shall be suitably protected so as to allow reasonable emergency access during flood conditions. Okay, I think that's all pretty straightforward. I don't think there's anything really to discuss there. Uh, that's a simple language add. That's the language recommendation of Marla's, which again, I would generally defer to. Easement. What do you want, back? Alvin? Can you go back up to uh, easements dedicated to town? Yep. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Where it says 20 foot wide centered on the pipe. No, it should be, uh, it should be 20 foot wide centered on the installed pipe. Okay. And uh, anything else there? Let's see, you, easement's not dedicated to the town. Uh, repair or modify the Installed. The drainage, the drainage systems contained therein. That's Marla's language. That edit there. Uh, the town shall be granted the right to enter such easements to maintain, repair, and or modify the drainage systems contained therein. Yeah, that's better. I had crossed out installments and put in. I mean, installations. They should have. It should, and uh, back it up, Alvin crossing out installments and inserting the word installation. But I like uh, Marla's description. Yeah. Right, let's see where we have the next set of comments, real comments. All right, and Marla did make a bunch of changes in the low impact development section, but it, a lot of it was just reordering stuff. Uh, this letter A, for example, was just uh, cut and pasted back into the intent section for the whole um, section four, uh, so that by the time you get down to low impact development, this is what that intent refers to. Uh, da, da, da. And uh, again, cut from earlier in the section, but now added here is the applications for subdivisions with four or more lots or for subdivisions proposing one or more shared driveways shall submit the LID checklist found in appendix. And I just haven't uh, named the appendix yet. I don't know what, what letter number it's gonna have. Uh, with the application, LID shall be incorporated to the extent practicable in all subdivisions. Uh, I do note that this comment from Marla came through today that she would like us to review that LID checklist, which um, as of this moment is carried over straight from the zoning regulations. Uh, I'll read her comment in full. A review of the LID checklist in the zoning regs, which has been recommended for inclusion in the subdivision regs, is not appropriate without further review and revision. Examples, zoning LID checklist, item nine states vegetated swales have been installed, and item 12 states 
rainwater harvesting methods such as rain barrels or cisterns have been installed. Such language is not appropriate for a design checklist. Consider removing the requirement for a checklist as the engineer's report referenced in subsection B2 requires a description of site strategies used and what parts of the CSQM were followed. Rather, it would be better to have an appendix with an application checklist that includes a listing of potential LID BMPs provided for in the design. Um, I have a question. Uh, you yep. Have? Applications for, four, for subdivisions, how about if I have three so I can ignore this whole thing? That is theoretically the case. Uh, there, we do use either the, the three or four uh, lot subdivision threshold as the trigger for a couple of things throughout the document. Some of those, I think, are by statute. Um, this well, one, I think, is more open-ended. Open subdivision by definition is three lots or more. Oh, right. You are correct, sir. You are correct. That's statute regulation as well. Yeah. There were definitely some places where, even though a subdivision is three lots or more, I think that we use a different standard threshold for some activities. So the question is, is this one of them? But then the follow-up question would be why? Um, I'm perfectly happy to set the threshold as low as possible to include LID, because uh, you know that green infrastructure is super, super important. Um, but I don't know what the reasoning is here for four versus three. I can't say that I do. Now, how about Marla's larger point, which is the uh, either the amendment of the LID checklist or of making it not strictly speaking an LID checklist, but a, a more inclusive checklist with other, other measures, I guess, that are referenced here in the subdivision. I think that's what she's getting in the subdivision regs. I, I think that's what she's getting at. Um, thoughts on that? I agree with her. I think there is a logic to that for sure. Anybody else have any thoughts there? Yeah, Mr. No, Chairman? Just, to, just to say that I'm with Alvin and, and Marla. Yeah, I can't, it, it shouldn't be too difficult for me to create a checklist based on these report requirements once the report requirements are finalized. I, it's just a matter of essentially making a list with check boxes, right? <laughs> Checklist. Uh, okay, continuing on. Uh, number three is, is eliminated, I believe, because it's redundant. All right, let's look at this section on roof runoff. Oh, those comments are all just the outlining and the outlining, I, I think I corrected it this afternoon anyway, when I went through this. Um, 
but we'll state again, just for the record, uh, there are inconsistencies in the outlining in the document because of sometimes what happens when I do the cut and paste or the conversion from PDF before this is finally published. I will review the entire outline top to bottom to make sure it's consistent. Looking forward to that. <laughs> okay, so that was stormwater uh, management and LID. Now we have an hour and we can go through soil erosion and sediment control. I think we're okay to do that. We do not have a new round of comments back from Marla on this, but we do have her original comments. And again, this is a section that we essentially already went over in the zoning regulations because this is not exactly cut and pasted. Uh, when we went through this in the first round, Janet did a modification to make it more appropriate for subdivision language. So I think we're okay to proceed. And then if Marla comes up with additional comments, we'll just put them into the discussion guide later. Um, you guys okay with that? We got the time. We can always go back to it just to, you know, to, to tweak it a little bit if we have to. Okay. If that's what, if that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, let's dive in. And, and I'll tell uh -huh. you, par partly because I think that these are technical sections where we're relying on various forms of expertise, Marla's and Janet's in particular. Um, I think we're just verifying to ourselves that, that we're clear. If we get through these sections, then next week when we talk about the uh, open space requirements for subdivision and conservation subdivisions, that's a huge topic and an important one. Um, and we can just fully devote the two hours to that. I would really like to be in that position next week. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. But we'll like, okay. let's go through this and we got the time. It shouldn't take that long, like you said, but we can all, you know, whatever is comments are given to us by Mahler and, and, and um, Janet, you know, we can always go back and review it. Should It won't, shouldn't take us that long. Yep, yep, yep. You okay, know. so and, Joe, and, and, and it, one more thing. Yeah, it, it, it wouldn't hurt to get one more opinion from some other uh, licensed engineer in the state, just okay. to have a third party, just for the for you know, the, I'm not taking nothing away. But I think right now we need to maybe get one more, uh, see what the opinion would be on it, see what that person's opinion would be. Right. You so know, the, the, the method that we would use would be to give this to NECOG's engineer because NECOG's engineer is the one who is employed to review these kinds of documents, mostly for towns that don't have their own engineers. We are lucky in that we have access to J&D and we've actually hired them to do some of this work, but they would be the logical choice. They're a neutral party that represents all municipalities in their 16 town footprint. So I can, I can certainly pass it on to them. It, 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 it wouldn't hurt, okay? Yep. This way, we get whatever feedback we, can, we get back from them, it's something that we can take into consideration. Not to take anything away from, from uh, Janet and Marla. Marla is right on top of her game, but it's just sometimes a third opinion can make a difference, you know what I mean? To, to, to yep. get... To, so people can understand that at least we're doing our due diligence. Yep. Joe, uh, can you in the existing book turn to whatever the equivalent section is here? Cause I, I'm looking at the sidebar comments and it looks like she is, she meaning Marla uh, has inserted in the first round comments, some questions as to why things were taken out. Yep, um, I'm here, it's yeah, it follows right after the, uh, uh, the section we were on, so. Right, okay. Uh, it, it, that's more or less her first comment here and that's just for the, the, the section in general. Uh, let us see. Right under intent. The provisions of this section are intended to prevent or minimize erosion and sedimentation by requiring the submission and certification of an erosion and sediment control plan, ENS plan. Ooh, Ray's coming. For any application for a zoning, pro oh yeah, that is a 
That's a good catch. Subdivision approval. All right, that's just linguistic. Uh, and this one is just a citation, we'll fix that. Okay, so let's, she's got a, why was this removed? And let's see if we can figure out what was removed. What is in between these items, Joe, in the current book, the narrative describing the proposed project, the sequence and schedule for grading and construction activities, the design criteria, construction details, and then letter B, the map. What is she yeah. commenting on what was, re what was removed? So in the current, there are, um, after design criteria, there are three, um, three additional, so um, the construction detail. So after the design criteria, the next subsection is uh, the construction details for proposed soil erosion and sediment control measures and storm water management facilities. The next one is the installation and or application procedures for proposed soil erosion and sediment control measures and storm water management facilities. Say it again, installation and what? Application procedures. and the person responsible for the maintenance of these measures during construction. That would should be a, 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 your uh, license engineer. And then the final section is the operations and maintenance program for proposed soil erosion and sediment control measures and stormwater control facilities as well as person and or organization responsible for maintenance or permanent measures when project is completed. Okay, so let's figure out why, let's see if we can retro figure out why they might've been purged. It may have been because they are redundant to, X, to other areas. So let's scroll down and just see. So I'm gonna zip back and forth here a little bit. You let the mouse to do it. I got the mouse to do it. Santos is my new best friend. <laughs> uh, he was just cleaning out one of his drawers. He was. <laughs> Well, the reason he's not on tonight is because his uh, company is moving their headquarters from Newton to Natick. So it may indeed be exactly that. <laughs> this may be an extra mouse from his office. Uh, okay, so I don't see anything that looks redundant to those items. I'm gonna leave a note here to myself, review existing. Okay, so that's a note to myself to double check, to just look at them side by side. Uh, all right. All right, here's a comment on the map. A map at the same scale as the site development plan. And she's asking what the required scale is. I believe that we have language earlier on in the section on site development plans that gives a certain amount of discretion on the scale to the applicant to make the plan as legible as possible, which I'm, I'm going back in my head here. 
which I believe is why we don't reference a, a specific scale here. Uh, Marla is recommending that we do so. Thoughts? This might be a case, Joe, where it might be helpful for you to look back into the prior section again, or into a prior section, since you've got in the, the in the current. Well, no, because that doesn't really help because we, I know the current does refer to specific scales, and we left that more open ended, based on the logic that certain plans are more legible at certain scales than others. Right. I don't know. What do you guys think about this? I, I mean, I still find that logic compelling, but so here, so here's where it, the comparison to the current is one to forty, or at a scale acceptable to the commission, which is a. I I I think what we because I, I think you're correct what we had said was you know make it legible um i think that is clearer than the way it is currently all right so let's and read it to me and i'll type it in verbatim well, no, I'm sorry. What I was saying is I thought, I think the way that we have proposed it, giving the applicant, you know, a little bit of flexibility in terms of legibility makes more sense than the way the current regulations have it written. Oh, Be okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood what you were saying. Yeah, I knew I wasn't being clear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what do we think this language is then? Instead of typing it over, I'll type it in the note. Uh, alternate language. Only From earlier in the, in the draft, earlier in the proposal. Uh, that what was it? At a scale of one inch equals 40 feet except i think that's backwards Hold on. one inch equals 40 feet or as is acceptable to the commission is that what you said Yeah, that how it, that's how it is in the in our current regulations. What I'm suggesting is that I'm I'm still misunderstanding you is what you're telling me. That's a, is that our proposal? You know, you had said, and I think you're right that earlier in this proposed draft, we had. You know, the, the scale is basically, you know, what makes sense for your property. What's going to be legible for the commission to read? All right, so I'm going to change this note. And I think should, that makes a lot of sense. Should we talk to Martha, see, seeing that she is the soil scientist, and see what she recommends for a scale? Well, she is recommending. Uh, oh no, she's not specifically recommending. Um, I mean, I can ask the, her that. I, I think you know we should probably do that instead of just you know putting something there on, off the cuff and having somebody that you know works with that with the soil erosion, you know. Well, the state. Well, yeah, I, I I agree with you, um, Ray. But I, you know, I, I also, you know, as as it's drafted now, right? I, the is there a compelling reason to have require a different scale for these maps than the site development plan maps? I guess is my question. That is a good question. Hey, Dan, Dan Malo, are you still on the call? Go ahead. Is that you, Dan? Yes. 
I, I'm just curious because obviously in your position, you read a lot of these. Uh, is the scale, is a certain scale particularly more legible, particularly more useful? Um, Uh, we get plans in every shape and size. Um, I, I wouldn't say that one's any better than the other. Okay. So what, uh, Dan? So you could you, so you could use a scale of one one to forty, one to twenty, one to thirty, whatever suits whatever. Yeah. So what, yes. what is much uh, the better word I'm looking for? What is going to be much? Not much more, but applicable for the condition. Would that be correct? Somewhat correct. Well, it depends on the size of the property. So yeah, um, the size of the project, I think will determine the scale. And we have the rulers in the office to, to, to work with any, any scale thrown at us. Oh, wait a minute. I got, I got one right here. I can dig it up. That's, I have to carry, it. but yeah, because every a lot of different, a lot of the licensed engineers or companies, they have their own set of scales. Like some use the one to twenty, some use one thirty, one forty, or one fifty, so to speak. You know, I mean, it, 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 but what is the basic scale number? What uh, is my question? All right, because I've worked with different scales, you know, on on things, but what would be the best solution? have a the, no. the one that uh shows the the best uh the the detail for the plan um i i don't really have even a personal preference i i, I don't see him so frequently um that uh, i i see the same kind coming in we just get one when we get one and we pull out the ruler when we need to to measure um but I've noticed on larger properties uh, that they'll, they'll work with a different scale than uh, a single family home uh, on, a, on a smaller property. So what Dan is, is, you know, commenting here does match essentially the logic behind why we left the scale at the discretion of the, the map preparer or the developer in the first place uh, is because a different size property is going to allow you a different level of detail. So what? Uh, okay. So why we so, just... so based on that, I, I guess I would suggest sticking with Joe's original comment, which is, or, or a variation of Joe's original comment, which is matching whatever this language is to similar language uh, regarding the map requirements. That makes sense to me. I. No, for, for maps for wetlands, do they have any kind of, um, um, I don't know if it would be bylaws or, or regulations that they go by, you know, because we'd want our, our maps to match what they have, you know, what it says and what, you know, what they want. That's a good point, Ray. I was just going to bring that up because, you know, that why that's why a lot of times, Ray, we there's things that we have we have done in the past and i'm going back and, and you know i'm going back six seven years ago when i first got on there was some issues that came along and we referred back to the inland wetlands because like you just said that the inland the, the, whatever is going to be considered wetlands and we can change the course of what is going to be done on you know as a subdivision or, or whatever. So the scale could change because of that. Well, we're different commissions, but we should still work together on, on you know, to keep our, all our paperwork as close as possible. That, well, uh, that, that's what the intent is, is to try to get the paperwork as close because before it was way off. You know what I mean? It could be way off. The whole idea is to get it as close as possible. Dan, you haven't done enough work with the wetlands regulations to be able to verify that one way or the other, have you? Not in Thompson. No, that's that's fine. I'll just have to go and, and take a look. Marla, I think, is out uh, you know, working remotely now because she's had her second surgery. Uh, so I'll just take some time to dive in there and and, and take a look. 
Uh, note to self. What is what what is uh, uh and it's a question for Dan, if I may, is is with your experience, uh, and you've worked in other towns as well, in the town you're in, is, is there that much of a variance, in you know difference, so to speak, in you know in the in the scale, you know uh where. To be honest, I've never cross referenced uh, in, in Windsor Locks the, the wetlands scale requirements for the application versus uh, the zoning. I, in my experience, we've taken applications at every scale um, or common common scales, like at least. Um, but there was no um, effort for. Um, sameness in, in the documentations that I was ever consciously aware of, I guess. All right, I'll take. But if, if there is a day. document that uh, already sets a standard for scale, um, it wouldn't hurt to keep consistency be with the, the, the documents. I, 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 I'm just not familiar enough with uh, the Thompson wetland regulations um, to know if there is one set in the, the wetlands regulations. Okay. Thank All right. you, Dan. So welcome. that's more homework for me. Fun times, no problem. Uh, do I? <laughs> uh, okay, Joe, going back to the existing, because we have another why was this removed comment. And this uh -huh. is again under the map. Uh, so I'm guessing it's something between these bulleted items, the existing and proposed topography, that should be of, topography of wetlands watercourse is, and water bodies and location and design details for all proposed soil erosion and sediment control measures. Is there something between those? Yeah, so we, um, we combined two, so that wetlands, water course, and water bodies, that's part of B or part of the second um, bullet or first mm -hmm. bullet rather, sorry, um, are it combined two. Um, next is any existing structures on the project site and proposed area alterations, including cleared, excavated, filled, or graded areas and proposed structures, utilities, roads, and new property lines. Hmm. That was a mouthful. So I'm just wondering what the answer is to Marla's question as to why they were removed. Keep because this information is important in determining the appropriate ENS controls to be used particularly when subdivision lots may be developed at different times. Okay, so what are we, let's assume for a moment that we are accepting this logic. Oops, come on. There we go. What would be potentially added back in? Any existing structures on the project site? Yep. And then proposed area alterations. Including cleared, excavated, filled, or graded areas. So that's this third bullet point. Yeah, uh, yes, in a new way, yeah. So I don't think we need that because we, we are saying it, we're just saying it in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. And was there anything else or was just that it? 
Um, proposed structures, utilities, roads, and new property lines. Proposed structures, utilities. Oh. And what else in property lines? I'm wondering if some of it got folded into three, which is not something that exists currently. All right, so let's take a look before we. It doesn't, the three that I'm looking at in front of me does not appear to mm -mm. repeat that information. It's more about the standards for mm -hmm. the ENS measures themselves, as opposed to showing existing conditions. This stuff is existing conditions. So structures, utilities, property lines. There was there was a something in between utilities and property lines. Roads. 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 Thank you. I mean, I too am wondering why this came out, honestly. Oh, I know. It wasn't that it came out. I know exactly why. Because we copied and pasted this out of the zoning regulations and the zoning regulations wouldn't have referred to those things because you're not dealing with roads, the design right. and construction of roads. That's why. Okay. So that was a good catch from Marla. Now it makes sense and we can feather that back in. All right, see, we do figure it out. Didn't take much to jog your brain. <laughs> really, I feel like that was kind of painful. <laughs> 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 Why was reference to stormwater management facilities removed? What exactly is meant by the term stormwater? It's not even there, so. And that's not in the language that you're looking at either, Joe. Anything about stormwater management facilities? Um, yes, that is in the location. Yes, so in that location and design details, it currently includes and stormwater management facilities after sediment control measures. And I think she prefers the word structures to facilities. I think that was another comment that she made elsewhere. Okay. All right. I think we're closing in on this. I think this is a fairly short section. We have another, why is this removed here? So let's see what this is in reference to. Under procedure, can you Upon receipt of the complete ENS plan, the ZEO will review it for compliance with these regulations. Doesn't seem like that's where the omission is. Is there something between? Um... Well, so. Is there something between the ENS plan shall comply with the following criteria and then the next section on procedure. Yeah, so what has so what it is is section 6C is erosion and sediment control plan. Section 6D is minimum acceptable standards. Uh, and it looks like we've pulled some of that into that B2 or whatever B what whatever is just above procedure. So this A through F list. Mm -hmm.
So I got to do another compare and contrast in the office. That's all. Mm -hmm. I can do that. And then in our current, our the next section six e, it's issuance or denial of certification. Say that again, it, in between this section and what would then be procedure or late, further down? We don't have a procedure section currently. Okay. So procedure is added here. And then we've got compliance and inspection. Yes, which seem to re re, um, replace applicants responsibilities and enforcement. So D and E replace. So let's compare the language between D and applicant responsibilities. Under the suggested language for D, compliance, all erosion and sediment control measures indicated on the certified ENS plan shall be installed and maintained as scheduled. A cash bond or surety bond to guarantee completion of the control measures may be required in an amount to be determined by the commission in consultation with the ZEO and or wetlands agent as appropriate. If in the opinion of the ZEO, the control measures have not been installed or maintained in conformance with the certified plan, the property owner will be so notified by certified US mail. If the problem as described in that notification is not addressed within 24 hours of, the del of delivery, the ZEO may take steps to correct the problem using funds from any posted bond. Now you read what's there for applicant okay. responsibility. Yeah, it's not at all similar. So applicants response, so applicants responsibilities, it is the permittee's responsibility to anticipate for uh, unforeseen erosion or sedimentation problems and emergencies and to have the cap it's really about emergencies and unforeseen emergencies which I guess is most of them. Um, we don't, the, the, current the current regulations aren't as clear as that compliance section. There is an, in, the enforcement section says, enforcement of the soil erosion and sediment control regulations shall be the responsibility of the commission or its designated agent failure to properly install and or maintain any erosion and sediment control measures may result in the issuance of a stop work order until the problem is satisfactorily corrected. Okay, now just as you're reading those two, when you were saying that stuff about unforeseen emergencies, I immediately remembered that we did discuss that and everybody thought that that language was totally ridiculous that if you could anticipate something unforeseen it wouldn't be unforeseen first of all right <laughs> it would have been foreseen and i think that is why we ended up with this d compliance section which is much simplified as you are looking at it and you're the only one looking at that text um, does anything stand out to you as something that is missing and critical to this section um and i'm not talking about the enforcement i'm just talking about the applicant responsibility right right there is a bit about if in the event of an unforeseen emergency in which adjacent properties, roadways, wetlands, or watercourses in the town of Thompson face imminent danger of pollution or obstruction from erosion and sedimentation, and the permittee or his designated agent cannot be contacted for reasonable effort, the commission shall, shall empower its agent to act to stem the threat of erosion and sedimentation. 
except to, except to the extent prohibited by applicable law, the expense for re remedial action shall be recovered from the permittee. That to me seems in concept valuable, but I'm not sure. Rather than me even trying to encapsulate that, can you tell me the um, article section, subsection there? Yeah, it is uh, section six, F six. What do you guys all think of, of that? Joe, you might have to read it again. Yeah, happy to if... Um... Uh, uh, Joe, just before you read it again, from what you already, what you just read, and you're going to read it again, my thought on that is, is that um, <laughs> for the, our, it, in other words, it's going to end up sitting on the CEO's shoulder. On mm -hmm. that, right? All right. One, and, and it's not taking anything away from Cynthia Dunn, but the only one that could probably really define that would be one, it would be the inland wetlands agent, which would be Marla, or the town um, supervisor of the highway department, because that's what they deal with. They deal with working with all the drainages and everything. So they're the ones, in my opinion, that those two would be the only ones that could say, all right, this is what the problem is. This is what's going to have to do to get, you know, to either get it corrected or whatever. Uh, Tara, if I could uh, chime in. Yes, please, yes, Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So a, a lot of ENS that uh, a town a, a person would be sent out to inspect is pretty standard and routine, like straw wattles and uh, silk fences. Yes. Uh, Cindy Dunn's probably looked at a million of these in her career. <laughs> um, they're, they're just so common that and typical, uh, it is also though, my opinion that, um, public works and wetlands should shoulder that in, in the workload. However, it, yeah, it, 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 because they're, they're more of the governing, uh, agency on that stuff. That's, they're supposed to know what is the correct fence, you know, how much fence, uh, silt fence, uh, you know, I mean, it, and, uh, you know, requiring hay bales, you know, you know, a lot of times they put the salt fence down with hay bales, which helps stop the erosion and everything. That's a lot of state jobs. Uh, they do that all the time in certain areas where there's wetlands and stuff, you know, when you're doing big construction and stuff like that. You know, it, thanks, Dan, because that's pretty much would be, you know, with, with, with three different points of view you can at least have a better grasp on it, you know, of, of, of the situation. In my opinion, okay, from working this stuff. Okay. Yeah. See, uh, yeah, yes, Alvin. Uh, I'm looking in the uh, zoning regulations under procedure C. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, let me, what you've got on the line there, I'll start at the discretion of the CEO. Yep. The, any plan submitted may also be reviewed by the Eastern Connecticut Conservation District and or the wetland agent for the town. ECCD and or the wetlands agent may propose additional control measures to be incorporated into the plan, yep. which, which the commission may take into consideration. that agent may propose additional control measures or changes needed to comply with the intent. Right, and we've got that in this as well, because that is again, um, this was a, a, a copy paste, uh, which is why we discovered some discrepancies that should have been changed for subdivision, but that seems straight up um, and logical, except that Marla did make a, a suggestion, which I just typed in here, uh, ECC, ECCD and or the wetlands agent may propose additional control measures or changes needed to comply with the intent of the ENS plan, that made sense to me, to be yeah. incorporated. Um, We're gonna to have to make a lot of changes 
back to our zoning regs if once all this is accepted. Well, there may be some areas where they should be different. Uh, well, I'm reading the language in Article 5B, Section 3, erosion and sediment control, mm -hmm. and it's very different than what we're talking about here in our present zoning regulations. So the zoning regulations, right. So this, this section was uh, when we were going through the first pass, um, Marla and Janet and I agreed that the, the logical thing to do would be to start with the copy paste, have J and D look at it uh, and see what needed to be adjusted for, to make it appropriate for subdivision. So that is what this theoretically represents. So there may be some differences between the two we discovered something earlier in the section that did not include uh, stuff that should have been retained for subdivision. So um, we may need to make some changes to the zoning regulations, but it wouldn't necessarily be based on what we're doing here for the subdivision regulations because they are slightly different. But I, I take your point. We're going to have to, look, I mean, we, we look at everything all the time anyway, right? So that's just something right. to consider when we go into our annual review on the zoning regs. Have any changes? Yeah. Um, okay. So now, Joe, and we're down into the last nine minutes, but this is the last section, which is so, the last little set of subsections, which is so fantastic. Read me again the stuff on enforcement, because I will say I do like conceptually, well, I do like the logic of including a description of the enforcement action, which right now we don't have. So it says enforcement of the soil erosion and sediment control regulations shall be the responsibility of the commission or its designated agent. Failure to properly install and or maintain any erosion and sediment control measures may result in the issuance of a stop work order until the problem is satisfactorily corrected. I have to say, I think that that is probably something we should retain, if not verbatim, then certainly in substance. What do you guys think? Uh -huh. I hear crickets. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I'm on the commission. And the, you know, it, it still comes down to, you know, whatever we decide as a commission, and, you know, and, and give the authority to the CEO to see if, make sure everything is in compliance of what is being, but I, I it, I still, I still, I still, I still, I think inland wetlands in, 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 in the municipality itself, the town, you know, the, the, the foreman or whatever, you know, they're the ones that got to go out and really kind of fix it. If something, if we have the erosion problem, whatever, whatever occurs from it. But yeah, that's a catch 22 for me. Sorry. Well, they're they're all arms of the town. The question is, who's the best equipped? I think is is what you're getting at. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if if we take in advice, what what the inland wetlands agent says, and then also what the input would be from the the uh, the uh, supervisor or director of the uh, town garage and stuff, because uh, they deal, he deals, that person deals with that all the time. Okay. And, and it's it's not to keep it all in one in one house and or shift the load around, but more eyes on it, we can have a better handle of it. You know what I mean? Uh, you know to control it somewhat better. You know because now you got two other opinions, and if the developer wants to start dancing with you on it, you know, uh, whoa, wait a minute, back up. You know, this is this, this is this, and this is this. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, John, I, I, I do have the, a question on, you know, it, it, it says for the soil erosion, but it doesn't say if it's erosion on the road or if it's erosion on the property. Well, you're right, Ray, but, but having those other two other uh, entities involved, then, then we, ha we can make a better, the, get a better handle and make a better decision. You know, if, it, if it's affecting the road, which is town, now it's got to get fixed, or, or the, you know, from the erosion of the property or vice versa. So, you know, there's that, fa there's that fine line in between. I'm, you know, I'm looking at it from the, as a construction type, you know, what the effect would be. On, on both sides, for, on for me, the side. Yeah, I'm just going back, just based on Ray's question, I just wanted to look at these two sections in the uh, um, outline items in, under the intent. It, 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 it's a fine line, be, you know, for that reasoning. You know, I mean, everybody's, you know, everybody can, you know, we should look at it from different perspectives. You know, Alvin will come in with some, he's, he's probably got some good perspectives on it. You know, I'm just giving you from my side, the, you know, what it, what it entails. But then, you know, I'm not saying I'm always right either. Because if our subdivision, what we're doing now is not going to be coincide with the regular regs, zoning regs, you know, that like, like we, we've been doing, you know, we got to review them anyway, because things do change. We have, have had things come up that we didn't foresee that was going to happen and it happened. And now you got to, now you got to kind of like improvise to get, to keep the situation in a, in a good manner or correct yeah, I think Ray makes a good point that it is referring to erosion and sediment control in general, but it isn't necessarily clarifying what the what the erosion and sediment is presumed to be affecting. Correct. Um, now, it may be that it's just such a broad catch-all that there are so many kinds of things that could be affected by erosion and sediment that it doesn't necessarily need to be spelled out. But I do kind of like the idea of describing the kinds of areas that could potentially be impacted. So let me take a look at that. It's, it's the old saying going away, the way thing you have to look, you have to see what's in front of you, what the potential of what could happen, okay? Yeah. And my experience is, is that it, you know you see the picture in front of you, but then you have to look, you have to play the devil's advocate. What's the possibility of what could happen, or the or, or this happening? Like Ray said, what, is it the erosion that could be a, could occur from the road because of the way the contour of the land is, vice versa, or you know, or from the property again, the contour, or 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 so there's a, a lot of variables that I kind of like I would be looking at. So what is the best solution? Well, you gotta you gotta you gotta kind of have to figure out what it would be the best solution. Not necessarily it's gonna be a hundred percent correct, but you know, anything better than 50% is better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we have a, a, achieved the end of the section. Yay, us. Um, so I've got all these notes as per usual. Now I can tell you that tomorrow, you know, I usually like to sit down the day after and, and do the revisions, but tomorrow, uh, in addition to Friday's being a short day, I have back-to-back -back calls and then a site visit. Um, so it's virtually impossible that I'm going to turn this around on Friday. I would expect I should be able to turn it back around to everybody on Monday. Um, and then uh, I believe we are again scheduled for Thursday of next week. Thursday, uh, okay. Right, because Monday's our regular meeting, right? 
Right. Whoa. Wait, and, then, and then the, the doodle had had more people available on Thursday than Friday. So uh, we're in for Thursday again next week. The and 31st. that again, the 31st. And that again is going to deal with, oops, 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 conservation subdivisions and open space requirements and subdivisions. Huge topics. Let me ask you this one question. You guys tell me if this is something you want or not. Um, as you know, I, I, I was gathering all of that background information on um, principles of conservation subdivisions. Would you like me to um, photocopy from some of these textbooks that I have, scan and send to you guys some excerpts to look at, or is that just too much reading in too short a time? I, if it's something you're interested in, I'm happy to do it. Uh, although, Joe, you might have to bring that one book back to me because that's actually got sample ordinance language in it. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, happy to do it, or we can just go with what we've got in front of us. Whatever you guys feel you've got the sort of personal bandwidth to look at, I I'm happy to accommodate. What books would you be sending it from? Where are you getting um, you know, this stuff from? So there is uh, one guy in particular who is the leading uh, writer in the country on it. His name is Randall Arendt. Uh, the textbook that he wrote, which is most instructive, uh, actually is, you know, conservation subdivision design. And then he's got a companion book, which has sample ordinance and regulation language. Uh, the thing he's most famous for is a textbook titled Rural by Design. Uh, it is the benchmark for communities essentially like Thompson that have um, a small town or rural or agricultural profile, but still are trying to use best practices both to maintain that character and to also be able to have reasonable development standards. Okay, I have found okay. them incredibly instructive. Okay, what's what's the name of what's what's his name again? Randall with two L's. Arendt, A R E N D T. Um, all those links that I sent you that snow day were all some of his online uh, freely downloadable materials. Those are separate from the textbooks, but they're great reading. And where does he where did, where does he hail from? Uh, he actually originally is from New England. He spent a lot of time in Massachusetts and Maine. He's done a lot of work in the state of Pennsylvania, the state of New York, but he's worked all across the country, uh, down to Texas, in Maryland, uh, a lot of work in Maine. Um, I think Pennsylvania and New York have been his biggest uh, fields of operation. Um, well, my, my thoughts, I mean, at this point, I would like to see what we have first before I pour into anything else at this, at, at you know, at, I want to see what we've got first. Sure, um, sure. And go and go over that because honestly, this I've got, um, I've got to go through the packet for the meeting on Monday night too. Um, so my reading ability uh, for this week is pretty well shot because I have unfortunately other things, but that's just my opinion. I would rather go and see what we've got. And then if we need any input, um, then that, you know, then we can look at something else. But I'd like to start with us here in town. Yep, no problem at all. I just wanted to offer it out there for anybody who, you know, like me. Did you guys already get your out on this, for this week? I haven't yet. Uh, okay, they were just, sent. Because uh, Jane brought up the packets, and I know I didn't get mine, so I was yeah, just and, and 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 it's getting ridiculous that I have one day to go over. A, even Ray didn't even have them last time. Um, it's that's very frustrating. That needs to be addressed. That we have one day to look through those packets before the the regular board meeting. It's not acceptable. But, uh, let sorry, me try just, to let me try to forward it to you again because it's right here in the email, and you guys are definitely on this email. I, I just, did get it on the email, but I didn't get the packet itself. Correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. They've all been emailed out, and they've all been put into the mail. Yeah, yeah, I want my. I don't know why I can't, and I get it that there's a lot of stuff that has to be put in. But the the brunt of it should be mailed to us a week before that meeting. I want 
the packet via the mail. And anything else that gets added can be sent in through an email like everything else is done. But to give me literally, I will have one day to look over that packet and that's, and I want it in my hands. I don't want to sit here at my computer and print out 70 pages. So let me ask you this as a logistical uh, partial solution for you, Jane, and I'm just tossing this out there. Uh, Cause the reason they get mailed so late is because it, it takes so long to assemble the materials. Would you be able to pick them up instead of waiting for them to come to you in the mail? Cause that could be slowing you down. If well, Gloria, if I mean, Gloria's I, got it prepared on the Wednesday, which I think she usually does, instead I, of sticking it I in the work. mail, and by the time I day. get out of work, town hall's closed. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm, you know, it's I like I said, why can't the brunt of it, what they have together, be mailed out at the beginning of the week rather than Wednesday, and then if anything else comes in, have it emailed to us. I just feel that would be a little bit better and give me a little bit more time to go through the things that are in those packets. Joe, and, do, you, do you feel okay going over that as a possibility with Gloria and Cindy? Yeah, yeah, Gloria and I, yeah, Gloria and Cindy and I will will discuss that for sure. Because it's not, you know, it, it to me any other time, any other place that you go, you're given more than one day to look at something. And last time, Ray never even got his packet. And like I said, I don't have the time to sit here and have 70 pages printed out. I have to work. By the time I get out of work, town hall is closed. So that doesn't work for me. No, I hear you. I hear you. It is uh, nice to have a little bit of time to, you know, you get your packet, you can ride around and check these places out. So yes, you know, absolutely. You, you, know, you know what's going on, you know, you, you know what the lots look like. You, and, and the first meeting that we went to, we had our packets a week before the meeting, which I thought, this is great. It gave me enough time. And then that was gone. We had that for in, in November, when I first got on this board, I had that packet a week prior to the sit down table meeting. And it was perfect because I could look at it. I could take a ride. I could look at things. Now I that's, cannot do that. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jane, because that timeline hasn't changed at all. Um, I, Joe, the, I got it a week before. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, before. I don't, I, I, I hear you saying that. And I, I'm just saying that's interesting because maybe it had to do with the holiday. I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't that, know, you know, like I that, said, the brunt of the packet could be sent out a week prior. Right. The and other stuff could be emailed. Yeah. And, the, and we'll, we'll talk about it. All that information is in the, in the, in the email that comes. I understand that it's easier for us to look at some of the details um in print but certainly all those property that property information is all in the in the emails as well but cindy and, and gloria and i will sit down and talk about it for sure that i would appreciate okay guys sounds good um so we're closed for the evening again i will get this i expect to have all the uh, updates into the rolling drafts uh, before I leave the office on Monday, I will send it to you, although I don't expect any of you to read it on the same day as the regular meeting. That just wouldn't be fair. Uh, and then um, let's say I should get the link to you. Um, well, I can get the link that same day as well. So, uh, and we'll plan on next Thursday, open space requirements for subdivision and conservation subdivisions are the topics. Have a great night, everybody. Well, actually, uh, Tara, we've got to get a, uh, a motion to adjourn. Oh, yes, of course. Make I'll a motion make, uh, to adjourn. adjourn. I heard Ms. Salsi move. Is there a second? I'll second that. And I, Mr. Williams. I, I'll seconds. wait for John to jump in there. <laughs> <laughs> I Ms. thought Fred we were going to end up, nobody, nobody was going to second. I thought we'd be sitting here for a while longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was hoping, just to keep Oh, yes, here. I know how you love it, John. <laughs> I know, it is, is something. Adjourned? I love you too, Jay. Yeah. The meeting is adjourned at 9.09 p.m. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have Thank a good you. night, everyone.